Hello and welcome back to episode number 58 of the TNC podcast. We've got more to digest this week than your average half-time pucker pie. And to join us, it's everyone's favourite Scotsman. Well, maybe second favourite behind Grant Hanley. Come on. <laughs> Sister Stuart Hodge, how you doing, my friend? How are you doing, mate? Yeah, maybe, man, I'm maybe good. First, maybe third behind Brian Gunn as well. Yeah, fourth behind Stephen Whitaker. Fifth behind Mark. You're, in, a, you're in the top ten, I reckon. <laughs> just about. Like, I mean, this is an ever-increasing list. Hang on, can we just say straight away, only 18 minutes late today. Yeah. Congratulations. An improvement. An improvement. My punctuality yeah. has seamlessly improved. <laughs> Absolutely. Mate, it's a pleasure to have you back. You're down in the fine city for yes. a week? Well, I've been here for a week and yeah. a day now, and I go back tomorrow. Mm. It's been busy. Yeah, you've been out. I've seen you in Stuart Webber's car. I've seen you with Alex <laughs> Neal. I've seen you, you know, just, just milling about being the media whore that you are. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, I don't think my mum would like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great to have you back. And, and, and as we say, Chris, we have got a lot to talk about. We've got two games to review. Yeah. We've got a midweek trip to South Wales and then the small matter of an East Anglian derby on Sunday. Yeah. Let's start, let, let's, let's, let's talk about the three points. Let's try and start happy mm-hmm. and then we'll decline very quickly. 2-0 against Preston. Yeah. That's surely positive, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I went out of that game feeling feeling optimistic because yes we'd played pretty averagely but that's the kind of classic championship fixture where if you come out of a game like that with three points you're like okay we could be onto something here because normally you would lose a game like that having played that mm. poorly and um, so yeah I, I came out of that game feeling quite optimistic and that was a really nice foundation to build on and um, out of the sh- if you take it back a step post Sheffield United I said that the next three games are massive you win against Preston, no, and this is no disrespect to Preston, but I'm going to disrespect Preston. Norwich City versus Preston at home. We would expect them to get three points against Preston. Leeds United is going to be tough. Ipswich is going to be tough. That's so for me, higher last year. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that. But I'm just saying on paper, yeah, yeah. looking at both squads and, and how much investment has gone into both, I would still expect Norwich to beat Preston. So being complacent, um, but I don't see beating Preston as a big deal. I just see that see that for Norwich City as a good championship three points. And I suppose if we want to be finishing where we want to finish the season, top six, they are the games you have to be winning. Absolutely. Um, Stuart, it was it was um, a fantastic goal from, from Alex Teto. I was very interested to, to see what you thought. I, I loved your article in the week on the EDP saying fans don't have the right to, to boo Alex Tete. Um, but let, let's sort of look at the game as a whole. What have you made of Norwich the sort of last few games you've seen? <sighs> Still a work in progress, to be honest. Um, unfortunately, I mean, one of the it's quite easy after a, a heavy defeat to be really negative. Mm. Um, and I must admit, I was I was quite disappointed walking out of the ground. It was it was really frustrating. Um, I mean, that said, Leeds. I, I know we want to start talking about Preston, yeah. but Leeds are a great side. Um, yeah, you've got your Leeds polo on today and everything, haven't you? So <laughs> Leeds. This no. this is Leeds yellow. This is. Oh yeah, actually, it's got blue. Um, so I didn't consider that, but I was going more for canary yellow. Yeah. Come oh, on, okay. come on. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, when it when it comes down to. It, I think Norwich City, I don't see a massive... I mean, I know we've lost James Madison, we've lost a few other players, but I don't see a massive amount of progress, I've got to say. And the the barometer for me was... At the last time I saw Norwich City in the flesh down here was around the same stage of last season. Mm-hmm. So, basically, I had a kind of season gap where I thought... And obviously, I've watched games from afar, but you know yourselves, it's, it's a different, yeah. different beast watching it inside the cara. And, yeah... I don't see that we've moved forward all of that all that much, and and that's that's disheartening. Straight away, I'm going to just hit you with a tweet. Stephen Bennett tweeted it to me this morning. I've just screenshotted it to read it out to you because I, th- I think it's a very interesting point. Mm-hmm. How long has it taken Leeds players to adapt to their system? Fark had 14 months, and we're going backwards. That's that's a, that's an opinion. Mm-hmm. Things need to change at this club, and not just the coach. So what what Very is the di- what, yeah. I mean what what is the difference? How have Leeds, if you if you take them as a case study, I know they've got a ton of money, but how have they managed to literally set the league on fire instantly? But their manager can't even talk a word of English. Mm. Now that to me speaks huge volumes and, and I think, of Daniel Farker's management. I style. think the big thing, and we'll, we'll get onto you in a minute, Stuart. But 
the big thing for me is Leeds, I think there was only one player different in that starting eleven to yeah, the team we beat um, 2 1, and, and they looked turgid at the end of last <laughs> season. Sure. So it shows how much of an impact a coach can have, yeah. and it also shows how much of an impact a coach can't have in the effect of Daniel Farker, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can say that Farker's completely ineffectual. I think that's yeah. probably hyperbole, but you, your question was what, what can happen to make the impact so quick? Mm. And I think the answer to that is Marcelo Bielsa. He's one of the most interesting characters in the entire global tapestry of the game. Mm. He's a really, really interesting coach. He sits in a nice bucket. Um, there's a brilliant clip mm. that uh, when I was on the scrimmage in midweek, um, Chris Gorham tweeted, and it's where when he was Marseille coach, someone sat a coffee cup in his mm. nice bucket, mm-hmm. he sat mm-hmm. on it and then got up <laughs> really angry. Um, but Bielsa, he's, he's a really interesting character. And he's, I mean, Pep Guardiola, has said that he's the best trainer, which is the the Spanish sort of translation of the word for coach, in the game. If Pep Guardiola's saying that, Mm. then, I mean, that's high praise indeed from one of the global luminaries. Bielsa is a footballing savant in many senses. Mm -hmm. He's a really clever guy. And he's obviously, football's a universal language, that's a cliche, Mm. but he's proving it. Yeah. See, do you think it's more than being a clever guy, though, Stuart? Because, I mean, I have absolutely no doubt in the world that Daniel Farker, he gets football, he understands it, he's very tactically sound, that's an opinion. I think he's got all of the football knowledge that you could need. Mm-hmm. But I look at Bielsa, I look at Mourinho, I look at all of the top managers in world football, and I see what you've said there, which is character, mm-hmm. and I see passion, burning passion. I see a manager that goes 1-0 down, or concedes one goal in a 4-1 win, mm-hmm. and goes ballistic, and mm-hmm. barks at their players. And yesterday, one of the most frustrating things for me personally, I don't know what your opinion is on this, but I watched Daniel Farker, 1-0 down, nothing. 2-0 down, nothing. 3-0 down, something. But we're 3-0 down then, and it's too late. And f- and for me, I don't... I, I mean, I've been very interested in in watching the, the Manchester City documentary on Amazon Prime. I, I know it's a very Americanized thing, mm-hmm. but the one thing I've got from that is, and you say what you like about Mourinho for, for being a bit of a dick, because he is, but if you get the respect of your players and you have this burning passion, and I just don't see Daniel Farker at halftime grabbing his players by the cuff and neck and saying, come on, let's do this, L- having a bark. And I, I just... I, I'm starting to doubt that there is that respect there, for, even from the German players. Mm, I, I don't think the players uh, the dressing room's definitely not turned on I, I don't think that's a factor I do think a lot is sometimes made of managers that do the hand wringing on the sidelines but it's to do with standards for mm-hmm, me mm-hmm. and if you look at standards uh, there was a point in the second half where Bailey Peacock Farrell um, he hit a ball straight out of play and Bielsa went like that's not good enough. Really? Yeah. yeah. And that's 3 0 up, I think, at the time. Or at that's least 2 up. And it's to do with standards. So I don't think it's to do with necessarily the barking or the shouting because some managers can be quite quiet, quite quiet spoken, mm-hmm. but their words carry weight. Mm-hmm. I think I think for me, and I'm going to go back to a few weeks ago when we played Stevenage at, at home and we had uh, Max Aaron's and Todd Campbell on the same side, two players who've hardly played first yeah. team football. And the interesting thing there for me was. He was barking at them. He was constantly in their ears. And for me, he'd set unrealistic expectations on them players. Todd Cantwell isn't a winger. He's a number 10. Mm-hmm. He was being stifled. Max Ahrens isn't a left-back. He's a right-back. He was being stifled at left-back. He was being put in there because James Husband simply isn't good enough. One of Farker's and Webber's signings. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the flip side, we've seen under Farker, Russ Martin frozen out of the squad. Wes Houlihan frozen out of the squad. Nelson Oliveira seemingly deemed not good enough is this a power issue is he seeing the bigger players the more influential players as a threat to him and the younger players more sculptable I don't know and and, and, and to also add to that I, I don't care if Farker's on the sideline not barking at players what I want to see is a reaction on the pitch every single game I've watched our substitutions have come late formations haven't been changed and for me yeah. that's the worrying thing and yeah, yeah. Stuart has an excellent point about standards now, say what you like about off the pitch, because we're talking about it from, that's just what we think. It's what we can sniff out. We think that there might be a lack of respect there. Now, let's talk about on the pitch. You, you talk about standards, Stuart. Mm-hmm. Why the hell is Timmy Close playing up front 
on the left wing. There is no way that they're listening to Daniel Farker's orders. Marco Bielsa had his team bang on the money. You could see the structure of the formation. One was covering for the other. Mm -hmm. Two touch, the whole game of football. Mm -hmm. I don't see that from Norwich. And I'm not saying I am jealous of Leeds, which hurts me to say, but I am. It annoys me because it's so doable. It is so doable. And you know what? I get... I totally get the culture that Daniel Farker is trying to establish, this possession-based football. I get it, and I think it can work. I just don't think the players are adapting to it. I, I think part of the thing for me is to do with the tempo. So I look, I look at Moritz Leitner, and there's definitely a footballer in there. Yeah. He's got great technique. I think, to be honest, if you're going to be playing him in the centre of midfield, I don't think he's strong enough for mm. that. I think his position in British football, anyway, has got to be the 10. Yeah. But yeah. I don't think he's doing enough to justify selection in that role yeah, okay. at this point. Okay. But the key thing is, you're watching Moritz Leitner and he's taking two, three touches mm -hmm. before deciding what to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas when Leeds have got the ball, right, or, or their equivalent player in a similar role, they've got options running in front of yeah. them and they know yeah. everyone knows the runs that they should be making off. Whereas it's as if sometimes watching it, Norwich City are trying to wait to try and make that happen. And, and the tempo is slower. Agreed. It's a bit more languid. And I think the ideal that Norwich City are aspiring to is something like what Fulham were in yeah. this division mm -hmm. and Leeds. Yeah. Now, that that seems to me, at least sort of reading between the lines, that's what Norwich City, that's the benchmark and the style and the philosophy that they are going for. Unfortunately, it's still a work in progress. Mm. But, I mean, the, the argument with that is, I was here at this stage last season, yeah. I've not seen a massive amount of progress. How can it? I, I, see, I'm with you on that, and I'm with everyone that says it's a work in progress and a, tra and a transition. I get that. We're now enough games into the season. Mm. So you, you, we needed to hit the ground running. As we, we said it on the podcast. The we we smashed in every single session on here. You need to hit the ground running next season. Mm -hmm. Not only to get the fans on board, yep. but to get the players going, to get everyone behind this. It's not happened, regardless of whether we beat Ipswich. It's not happened. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I was listening last week, um, Stuart, to the to the Pinkham podcast that you were on. I think it was either you or Dave Freezer raised a very good point, but I think a very simple point, mm -hmm. and that is the fact: are German second division players good enough? Is this mm -hmm. is this sim what is Marco Stiepelman? What is Dennis Schreiber? <laughs> that was you know, my question. Was what Leitner? is Marco Stiepelman? Because I don't understand yeah. him as a player. It's, it's, it's like he, he seems to be a jack of all trades, but doesn't seem to specialise mm. in any particular role. I, I don't understand. He's very versatile, but but I don't think he has a great impact in, from what I've seen at this level in any particular. We position. look at we look at a Felix Pass, like one of Germany's top rated players, can't even get in the squad. We look at Moritz Leitner, too slow. We look at Mario Vrancic last season, took six months to adapt. We haven't got that time in order to adapt. We can't be putting a player in and going. Well, he might be good in six months. This is the championship. Yeah. We need results. But but on the on the contrast to that, you see what's happening to Mario Brancic at the moment. They've clearly told him he's not good enough. Well, I think Kenny he's McLean has been brought in yeah. as a direct replacement. Absolutely, for Mario absolutely. Brancic. And the thing with Kenny McLean is, he's he's good enough now. He's an excellent yeah, player. Agreed. And I, I I love this project. I I want it to work so badly. But we had another tweet yesterday from Ollie Bensley who said. What do we expect? We've sold Madison for twenty five million. We've sold Murphy for twelve million. We've reinvested hardly any of that. What do we expect? We are getting what we deserve. Is it as simple as that? Is it far? No, nah, it's not as simple as that. Because okay, you look at one El Hernandez, who's going to have a great impact this season. Mm. He, he was another player that not spent a massive amount of money on. Um, Timu Pukki's come in and, and really impressed me not spent a massive amount of money on him Norwich City aren't going to go out and spend loads of money on players I mean and it doesn't guarantee success mm. Timu Pukki looks like a better version of what Stephen Naismith could have been at Norwich City yeah. and look at the stark difference in mm. what the club paid for him so I think a lot is sometimes invested in as a club spending money blah 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 mm. you can get good players for not a lot of money mm. but I, th I think the key thing is and Onel Hernandez is actually an interesting case came in January, we're seeing the best of them now. Mm. So some of these players, it's never going to work for. Yeah. Some of these players, it might take time, and some are going to come in and have an instant impact. And there's going to be a bit of that That's going the risk. on. Yeah. That is the risk. Key thing for me, I think going forward, midfield, there's enough options. We can kind of try different things mm. and put it together. Um, I mean, not really seen past like defence, it's, it's where the worry is yeah. mm. and we had that record breaking and this is where it's kind of confusing because a lot of people criticise Farker for various reasons 
the guy is tactically astute. Mm. If you concede four goals in two games and then go on a record break and run a clean sheet, you've changed something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wrote an article in the Pink in last year which said the one thing that Daniel Farker seems unable to do is find a balance where we can defend and attack at the same time. Yeah. And that question remains. It's just flipped, isn't it? We yeah. can't. Yeah, we can do one or the other, right? We can go um, four three against West mm. Brom. Then the defence is leaking goals. Agreed. Or we can do the Agreed. Preston thing. And he actually, Daniel admitted before that game, he said, um, we focused on getting the defensive rudiments mm-hmm. right at the start of this game. And then, to be fair to the boss, he made a tactical change, mm-hmm. albeit Pinto was hurt and, and it kind of forced his hands. But he didn't mm-hmm. just go like for like. He thought, mm-hmm. hmm, can I change something here? And I think it was with the idea of getting the best out of Buendia, which, mm-hmm. for all of the negativity at the moment, He's going to be a great player. Yeah, I love the look of Wendy. I, th- I love the look of him. Yeah, I agree. I think I think Chris for me the, the frustrating thing is it, is Farker came in and wanted to select set his philosophy and Norwich fans wanted that philosophy. For me, it still feels like a constant experiment. I don't think he knows what his starting eleven mm. is. I don't think he That's knows what point. his formation is. And I don't know what the philosophy is. Are we solid defensively and good on the break? Do we score goals and just don't worry about the defence? Do yeah. we keep possession? Do we move the ball quickly? Do we lure teams in with our possession-based football? I don't know what Farker wants to see out there. And if I don't know, I don't think the players know. This is, this is kind of... This goes back to my original point about... I just don't... I just don't think it's clicking. And I'm all for giving him more... Look, I'm just going to read out another tweet just to, just to pull more petrol on the fire. Um, I think, <laughs> you love it. I think, it's, I think it's quite hardcore. Um, it's, from, it's from Graham Leader. And he just says to, to the TNC Twitter account... Why are we still employing a coach with a worse win ratio than Peter Grant? Time for people to face the facts. This isn't going to come good under Fark. And every minute more he's here is another minute wasted. I think that last bit is probably too emotional and quite hardcore. But I think his first point is actually really bang on the money. And going back to this philosophy, culture, time, transition thing, it all, it all falls down to, to, to results. And at the end of the day... We look at managers that we've had in, in, in the past. We look at the likes of Glenn Roder, the likes of Chris Uton. We were so much more cutthroat. Yeah. But actually, the football provided more fruits than what we're seeing now. Mm. And I don't think this... And, I, and honestly, I don't buy this, oh, well, we've lost James Madison. Oh, well, we've lost Josh Murphy. I honestly think we've got a stronger squad than last year. I, I want to touch on a point that I've banged the drum of so much. I kind of want to just cleanse myself once more. Do you? Uh, Tim Krull. <laughs> uh, um, lots of excitement when we first signed him not for mm-hmm. myself interesting to see the excitement is gone um, yeah you were saying no, no 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 you what? can't say that you need to stop saying that you're saying the excitement's gone yeah. I think the excitement is still I think no I people, don't think it is people still see that he is an inter, he, he has been an international goalkeeper yeah. he's got a wealth of experience and that it will come right I'm still of the opinion that it will come right with Me Tim Krul I think you're you're in Remy's camp too much. You need to no, no, no. you need to take your Remy glasses no, off. No, I'm not. I, I, you think, are. I think people were, were were looking at Tim Crowell and expecting him to hit the ground running straight away. Let's Agreed. get to the facts. He has made a mistake in every single game this season, except for the Preston game. Yeah, eighty so percent of the games he's made a mistake in, yes, which has cost good. us points. Mm. And and to back you up, and, no, no, no. If if a defender makes eighty, it make, makes a mistake in eighty percent. He's of dropped. Games, he's dropped. Yeah. What's re- and what's fascinating for me, and more praise for Angus because I've got my Angus Gunn glasses on. He's made more mistakes in these games than Angus Gunn did the whole of last season, and that's why I don't get this whole experience thing. Angus hadn't played a professional game before he came to us. Mate, I'm backing you up here. I'm backing you yeah, up. Sure. What, do you, what do you make of Tim Krul, a, a player that people were so hyped about, having I, watched them, still... ha- having watched them in a penalty shootout three years ago? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fairness, um, I remember him playing for Newcastle in the Premier League. How long ago so. was that? Uh, a wee while because exactly. time doth fly yeah. um, but I th- I, listen I, I'm with you I still think it'll come good for Tim Krill but so far it's not made good reading for him he did make I, th- I think I've not seen the highlights actually but I think he made a really good save against Preston yeah tipped the bar yeah. as well um, so I mean I think there's a good shot stopper there He's looked not to... I mean, I look at Norwich City goalkeepers in the past. Uh, yeah, I know there was the aberration at the weekend where he kind of let it go through him. Um, there was a one where he threw it in against West Brom, Loris Carries style. Um, there's a lot there to make bad reading. And I think, I mean, it's, again, clicheometer goes bing, bing, bing. Mm. But um, goalkeeper, you're the last line of defence. If you make a mistake, everyone notices it. 
it's not been good so and far. Chris, I think, think he's a good keeper. Chris, Jack, I think where's the backup? I'm just going to put this little grenade in there. Who have we got to replace Tim Krull? Mickey McGovern, you happy with that? No. So uh, this is my point. And I, and I just want to say as well, I think Michael Bailey raised this in his match review yesterday. I'm not sure if Farker... I think Farker probably said something about it. There's pressure on Farker here as well. He's released a goalkeeper who's been here for 15 years, was told he was going to be given a chance, wasn't given a chance, and brought in a keeper that isn't performing. There's pressure on Farker, there's pressure on Weber here. They've brought in a keeper and released a good keeper, and he's not delivering. And we don't have backup. Hmm. Well, we do, but it's not good enough. Well, there we go. We, we don't have good enough backup. I, I think we could do an extra number in, in that position. Lone window still open. You know what's, what is, um, what's really interesting with this, with this whole thing? Is that I think uh, we said it yesterday. We we weren't going to bring it up, but we will bring it up because it, it fires Jack up a bit much. <laughs> if if Remy Matthews makes the same amount of mistakes that Tim Krul makes in these first few games, you kind of let it go because he's your boy. No, I don't. Yeah, I don't you get behind. I don't think we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remy Matthews was cast aside by Norwich City fans for making one mistake in preseason. He's not good enough. Had they watched him take a Plymouth I, side from? A relegation Mate, zone to near the playoffs. Have people watched that? If he does no, it in the league, we back him because he's our boy. I don't think I'll tell you what. They turned him in so quickly. Him on your I, team. Don't I, like, I like how angry you are. Um, <laughs> he had a really good season at Hamilton. Yeah, he and then Plymouth. Really, really good. Yeah, I mean, I saw firsthand at Hamilton how he did, and he was, he was, he was excellent. I'm not saying that Tim Krul isn't a bad keeper. I think there is something in there. It's the hypocrisy that really annoys me. It's the fact that. Remy Matthews was cast aside for making one mistake in pre-season. People haven't watched him at Plymouth. Think, People think, haven't watched him at Hamilton. Do you know something? I think there's actually a cultural thing there because you would expect with academy players that people would give them a bit more mm. crack of the whip. But I actually think with Norwich City fans, it's almost as if they're harder on yeah. them. It was mm. the same with the Murphy yeah. twins. Mm. I'm seeing a bit more of it with Jamal Lewis okay. now yeah. as well. Okay. I agree. I agree 100%, mate. But what, but what, and actually, just to... Just to make sure you fully understand what you're putting in the room, Jack. Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm I love not, this game. I, I love how, yeah, yeah, we wind each other up all the time. <laughs> you were very, very, very quick to be anti Russell Martin last season. Was he good enough? Very. Hey, listen to my point. Guy's a legend. Oh, well, I'm not. I'm not denying that. Guy's a legend. Norris City three and three. But now you're saying Remy Matthews, Norris City three and three, and we cast him aside. That's exactly what Daniel Farker did to Russell Martin, but you were okay with that. So I'm quite interested to see what the difference because is Russell between the two chance. players. Remy wasn't. That's the difference. Okay. Um, it's yeah. a really good point. Cool. For me, that's it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> is there anything else to great. is there anything else to discuss on the, on the Leeds game except for we would just crush basically? They're a really good team. Yeah. Are they marry if if they keep going early days in the division yet, but if they keep going the way they are, I, I feel looking at them, they marry the best qualities of Wolves and mm, Fulham. Yeah. And True. with that together, I I just think I mean I honestly think if Bielsa stays they are, they had a couple of signings maybe in January, yeah. which yeah. they've got the money to do. Um I think they're up. I'll say two things. One I think Hodgie brings up a great point about Moritz Liner with, with the takes too many touches. Mm. If you look at those Leeds players, every single one of them was two touch. There was not a yeah. single player that took more than two touches yeah. to the point where even if it was risky to only take two touches, they would still take two touches, risk losing the ball, but the opportunity to get that killer through ball to score was there for them. Mm. And that says everything to do you me. Know, do you know what summed it up for me? Do you remember mm. there was an attack where we were going down the right-hand side in the first half? It was after we'd fallen behind because we did start really well. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, we did start yeah. really well. I mean, one question that I would raise is for the stuffing to get knocked out the team so much by one goal, not yeah. two. Yeah. Like, is, is, I mean, there's got to be a question there. Yeah. But there was a, on your point, there was an attack down the right-hand side and it was Evo and it was Moritz Leitner. And they just kind of passed it from pillar to post. And part of it was they weren't sort of maybe looking enough to see what was happening. But there was nothing else happening. Yeah. See, in terms of movement, there was no options, nothing running off, no one coming short. Throw-ins as well. Jordan Rhodes has got three men round him. Mm. Every time mm. they hoist it towards mm. Jordan Rhodes. And you're thinking, 
where, where's the variety yeah, and the variation? Yeah, yeah. And that, that for me, is, is a, a big problem. Leeds, on the other hand, they would get the ball, Scythe would have it, and people would be making those runs. Mm-hmm. The type you see Manchester City making, mm-hmm. where it's not just a run out to make the pitch wider, it's a run inside your defender and then yeah, round, spin, which yeah. creates an angle. Yeah, It's the kind of thing that Alex Pritchard and other players that we've had in the past were seem to be able to do Wes yeah. obviously loved all that stuff oh I miss him no, I'm please missing. don't talk about Wes in this podcast either I miss him we're not allowed to talk about Wes either mm, I know I'm, I'm sorry but I do I miss him well he's, that's why he's on the wall behind you Hodgie he's a legend and anyway my second point about the Leeds game which I think we'll go on to potentially with the atmosphere thing I thought that I, it's, honestly I, I slate teams on here all the time and I will say loud and clear Leeds United fans were incredible Best I've seen at Norwich City in many, many seasons. They were excellent. And again, I'm just so jealous about the fact that they came. Was there like two and a half thousand of them? The biggest away following I've seen at Norwich in, in a long time, as far as I can remember. And they were so loud and they were so together. And even when we were on top, they were still loud and proud. And I just, I just thought they were excellent. And I just thought it was worth bringing up that I think that doesn't it make the hell of a lot of difference if your support is together as one mm. rather than just you know and actually they their away section more made more noise than the whole of our stadium put together yeah which uh, i think is embarrassing uh, uh, is embarrassing uh, uh well i totally agree with that the other side of it though is and and just to play devil's advocate a wee bit Leeds united fans they sense that something's happening yeah. at their football club. Yeah, yeah, They've yeah. had yeah, yeah, yeah. years in the doldrums, down to League yeah. One like us. There's been a lot of pain that they've gone through mm. and they sense that, do you know what, this time yeah. is happening for us. Yeah. So that's a factor as well. They're on the cusp of a wave at the moment. It's kind of like the magic that was happening when Paul Lambert was sort of soaring. Agreed. Through, totally uh, agreed like, with you. Uh, yeah. with, with Norwich City. Now, with that in mind... <laughs> kind of sort of begs the question as well is the team doing enough to lift the fans I mean I, I do feel that the fans need to do their bit more I wrote an article which which sort of made that point effusively however for for 80 minutes of that Preston game it was a nothing game mm. honestly like yeah, I, I've agree. seen kick yeah. arounds yeah. down the park where there's been yeah. a bit more sort of passion and Agreed. life to it Agreed. And, and that was a really galling thing we got the result in the end so all was well and good, and that was forgotten about. But there was a real lack of impetus in that mm. game. Right, um, lads, we'll finish briefly talking about this Leeds game. There is one last thing I want to talk about: is the formation. Um, mm. First two goals yesterday, and arguably the third, all coming down Iber Pinto's side, caught out of position, was quite out of position for one of a couple of West Brom's goals. I don't think he's a right back. I don't think it's his fault that he's out of position. I think there's players being played out of position. And I think we are much more suited to having wing backs and three centre backs. Yep. Is the formation the problem? Uh, could be. <laughs> I think I think there's more to it than that, but I think it is a factor. I think with the players that Norwich City have in their squad at the moment, I think the best system is three at the back. Yeah. However, I think there's a lack of defenders. I think you need an extra centre back if you're mm. going to play that regularly over the course of the rigours of a championship mm. season. Uh, you need to have a few more bodies. Also, Ben Godfrey deserves a chance. I yeah. just want to throw that out there. Absolutely. Yeah. So with you. He hasn't been getting in. So with you. Mm. For me, I think the, the only question for me with the formation is why on earth, apart from against Leeds and you know some of the other better teams like Middlesbrough, for example, why would you play two central defence midfielders at home? I just don't get it. I think away from home, when you do that thing where you just try and settle into the game, hold possession, frustrate the opponent and hit them on the break, I get that. But at home, when we're meant to be bringing the game to the opposition... By the way, I think that's nonsense anyway. I think we should be bringing the game to the opponents away from home too. But particularly at home, I don't understand why we're playing two central defensive midfielders. And I love Alexander Tete. He was was my favourite player when I worked for the football club. He was my favourite player for two or three seasons. I think the guy... He he's fantastic, but he should not be playing football for us. I'm sorry. He should be in and out of the team, and I get why they renewed his contract-ish. Mm. But for me, Tom Tribal, Ben Godfrey, all day long. Why are they not playing football? Why are they not playing football? Lou Stuart. Thompson as well. Hey, but oh, can we just talk about it? Lou Thompson? Had a, he was. I think he was brilliant. Yeah, you brilliant. know what as well. I think he was great, but I think he was stifled. He was essentially. Evo Pinto's babysitter for the majority. That oh, hard me. He was so played hard. as like a second right back. But can I say something? Right? So many players okay. been stifled. No, I agree. I agree with what your point is, but I'm going to put my head above the parapet with Evo Pinto. 
and say one thing. Everyone slates him defensively, and I think you've got a fantastic point. He shouldn't be playing in defence. Actually, you'd be a really good winger. He'd be a really good midfielder on the uh, wing. No, 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 no. Hey, hey, delivery into right, the box is right, not Hodgie. consistent. All right, Hodgie, but one, one thing I will say is he made more problems for Leeds than any of our midfielders and any of our forwards <laughs> yesterday. Look at the stats, look at the facts, and come back to me on that. <coughs> no, that... Do you know what though? That I know was, he's a defender. He offers good dynamism, good thrust down the line, right? But his crossing is not. Yeah, I love the way he's thrust. That. He's not good enough and, uh, with his crossing. Like his crossing is nowhere near consistent enough for him to play in the wing. We've got Ben Marshall, who's I think yeah. a better option for yeah. that kind. Mm-hmm. Of Absolutely. I'm just all I'm. I'm agreeing with Jack's point about. I think that players are being played at a position. I don't think there play. is a position where you can accommodate Evo Pinto. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I really like him. He's a likable player. A likable mm. guy. But I think the problem is, um, and this is the problem with football, because especially when you're involved in the game, you get sort of a wee bit kind of closer to the players and, and what have you, and our kind of job. Like the the problem is, you can't be blinded by the the non football inside of yeah. things. Evil yeah, Pete yeah. was a likable guy. He's got, by the way, he's got a brilliant attitude. I'd love to play in his team at five aside, <laughs> but my problem is, I don't think he has the the defensive now is to shut the door at the back yeah, yeah, yeah. in yeah, this division yeah, and if you're playing them in a four you're going to be wholeheartedly yeah. exposed mm-hmm. down that side which mm-hmm. we were yesterday um, right Chris let's let's try and lift this a little bit um, okay. you want to um, say something about James Myhill a, a, a great Norwich City fan yeah let's so basically this is a bit of a call to action for everyone listening on SoundCloud and iTunes and watching on YouTube right now I want you to all do me a favour. I want you to follow on Twitter James underscore NCFC91. That's James underscore NCFC91. The guy is a massive Norwich City fan. He's currently battling cancer. And I think that it would be so ridiculously valuable if everyone just, first of all, followed him and tweeted him your words of support because the yeah. guy needs it right now. And I think that um, it would just, it'd mean the world to me. But actually, I think it's an example of how we should come together as a club. Um, and I, I think it'd be an excellent thing to do. Yeah, definitely. So as I say, tweet your words of support. Yeah, I think sometimes we get caught up around the whole football and who yeah, should be playing yeah, it right yeah. back. This is more important than this. No, City can have real sort of action, can't they? Football players are human beings as yeah. well, just to say that. People forget that. And um, all the best. And keep fighting, James. Definitely, mate. Uh, right, let's bring the tone right back down. Uh, a trip to South Wales <laughs> on Tuesday night. That is as good as it is. is isn't it? Actually, I really like Cardiff. I love South Wales. It's you great. really like Wales. Uh, yeah, Neil Lorne. Well, it's not till I. You like, sorry, sorry. Yeah. You like South Wales. Yeah, I, I, know South you've Wales. Got, I know you've got Welsh roots, Jack. But Yeah, I love South Wales. But the thought of people going on like an eight hour coach ride there on a Tuesday night does make me feel a little ill. I would, mm. I would honestly be checking how sound they are in the head, to be honest. I mean, TNC writer Will Jennings has bought his tickets for Cardiff, <laughs> and, and I'm questioning his morals right now. Fair because, play. I've got a lot of love and respect for everyone doing it. I really I do. I mean, Stuart, look, what is there to say about this game? I kind of hope we get knocked out. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's the problem with this cup competition now, especially when you look at this, the bloated calendar. And, and let's also add, this is regionalised. Yeah. <laughs> this is a regionalised competition. <laughs> And we're going on a 600-mile round trip to Wales. Yep. Yeah, but the Chinese definition of regionalising is a lot different to the English version of regionalising. <laughs> clearly. <laughs> clearly, yeah. I mean, they're, at least their their draws weren't made in sort of eastern China at four o'clock in the morning. Eastern yeah. Timor, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, is, what is there to say about this game? What team do we put out? I suppose that's what I will say is I like the way that you two have instantly gone with the, we could do it for losing this, really. And I'm not. I'm not saying I disagree, but I'm going to say this opinion, which a lot of people say is, we need to win games of football now, lads. Mm. We're in, we're looking really poor. So it would make it would do the world of good to to win against Cardiff. But ultimately, I agree with you two. But it is interesting that a lot of people will feel like we should go out for the win, full strength strength team, and try mm. and win it. But for me, I. I would, I would actually, if it was my choice, I'd play all of the second string players. I wouldn't play a single it's a first good, string player. It's a good chance to get game time. It's yeah. a good chance to get minutes and legs. Yeah. It's a good chance for a few players on the fringes to stake a claim. Yeah. Because it's not as if anyone in that team is, is mm-hmm. indispensable at the moment. I, yeah. I wouldn't say so. Agreed. I, th- I think for me, I'd, of course I don't want to go there and lose, but it's me. I don't want to risk first team players. I don't know if there is a first team but the likes of Hernandez and your Jordan Rhodes are crucial to what we're trying to do at the moment but except for that I don't really know I just don't want to see injuries to top players we saw last season didn't we the games against Arsenal and Chelsea kind of really ruined us at times in terms of 
really tired legs in the next games and it cost us so do you know an interesting thing though did you not notice how Farker was more comfortable in the tactical side yeah. of things going up against the Premier League yeah. teams and people are wondering maybe why Stuart Webber is persisting with Daniel Farker despite all of the the, the, the many things that are, can be questioned at the moment maybe that's part of the reason and I did say that in the piece that I wrote at the start of last season saying that Norwich City fans need to be patient they need to get used to mm. a new style of football which by the way isn't happening like still get it forward like every time like mm. Norwich City try and recycle the ball but do you yeah. get that Stuart because it's clearly not working the way we're going eh, I, don't, I don't get that it's not working every time if you've got two okay. men in front of you just as a situation if yeah. you've got two men in front of you and they're marked yeah. right and you pass the ball back so that they can run off their man to get yeah. into space that's good tactical yeah, awareness yeah. it's what you should do but if you're chasing the game 80 minutes and, and, and there's nothing sort of happening going forward and you're just passing it back because there's a lack of running or a lack mm. of options in front of you. I get that that's frustrating. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, the bigger point I would make is regarding the, the, the sort of Daniel Farca and the style of play that he's trying to implement, if we can get it to work in the Championship, I think it will give us a better chance of success in the Premier League. This style, whether it's with him or with someone else, I think this kind of modern football approach, I think you'll see Fulham stay up and I think you'll see Wolves stay up. And obviously you can point to the money they've spent, but which is a factor there. as but well. But they're there, Stuart. Yeah, 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 I get that. But I think that's why this is the style of football that we're going for. Whether Daniel mm-hmm. Farke is the right man to implement that and, and carry us over the line, that's obviously open to debate. But I think that's why this is the culture and the philosophy and stuff that we're trying to implement. Culture's an important word. You said we have to win games now, lads. Mm. We do. Mm. American sports make a big thing about instilling a winning culture. Mm. Norwich City don't have that at the moment. Well, okay. Uh, the last strong. thing I'm going to add on this Cardiff game, uh, if you've got any money sitting around, get on fans, bet, put it all on Josh Murphy to score. But that's guaranteed <laughs> to happen. Uh, let's move on then. Ipswich, Norwich, East Anglian derby. Um, you said in your fan camp it was the title. You're worried, Chris. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. Right. I think, I just think just, I've be... just got the table here of Prince Green to Ipswich Town without a win in five games. They also lost, lost to Exeter in the Cup. Rock bottom, oh, two man, points. I know. I know and you're, you're worried thinking. against that. I know what you're thinking. Yeah, but they're at home. Yeah. The gaffer yeah. hasn't won a game. Mate, mate. It, 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 right, and, and, and it's you, gonna you'll res- this will resonate with you very well. Right, Re- when Rangers come up against Celtic, I know it's a very different derby. Mm-hmm. But I think Rangers have actually got a psychological advantage going into the game because they've got nothing to lose. Yeah. Because Celtic always beat them. Mm-hmm. Right. So my point is, when Ipswich go into this game, they've got no standout quality. In my opinion, they've got no standout quality. They come up against Norwich. They've been tonked season after season, beaten, battered, bruised. We scraped the one they win against them last season. We we just made sure that they didn't beat us last season at home to that amazing last-minute winner to shut them that all up. That was crazy. Absolutely. But my point is, going into that game, the Ipswich fans, they don't need to worry. Honestly, Ipswich fans don't need to worry going into that game because they've got nothing to lose and we're not playing really, and we're not playing some nice football at all. So that's what, that's what makes me nervous. And, and, you, and you reading out those, those stats, those figures, those facts, Jack, there, makes me even more worried. Because what a lift it would be for Ipswich to be Norwich when they're bottom of the league, everything, to really rub it in. Everything, you know the way that football goes, everything is pointing towards Ipswich getting over the hump. Yeah. It's got, I know it, it But has, didn't we say that last we, season as well? And the season before, and the season yeah, before, yeah, and the season yeah, yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And listen, do you know what? See, another thing. Norwich City need to get beaten by Ipswich because this is just hanging over us yeah. like a dark cloud. Yeah, it's, it's a good it's point. Like, it's one of those things really where if we get it out of the way, then that's it, it's done. <laughs> Um, but I mean, <laughs> but it would be horrific. But let, let's let's take the. I know it's hard. Let's take no. the emotion out. Of no. This. no, no, no. Just listen to me. I hate that. I hate that. No, no. Let's take the emotion out of this. Ipswich are without a win in under Paul Hurst's reign. They've sold their five top scorers from last season. Waghorn's gone. McGoldrick's gone. Um, Garner's gone. They kept hold of Bielikowski, which was, was great business. They've replaced them with, I don't know if they're going to be good, the likes of Caden Jackson, League Two players. They might be good, I don't know. But Chris, this is a team who are rock bottom. This is a team who took a manager from League One last season. This is a team that have replaced their five top scorers with League Two players. If we can't beat Ipswich 
it's game over for Farker. You reckon? You reckon that'll be the, the it should be, she's on? but it won't be. Okay, how many, like, if we were to go on a run of consecutive defeats, how many would it take? League, let's uh, say Cardiff's in irrelevance. I think that you need to be in the relegation zone, having lost four or five games on the bounce. We're close to the relegation zone. We're one point off it. I know, I know, we're only five games in, but... What, what annoyed, so I, what I've, let's, sorry, just to go back one step. What annoyed me with that opening question, Jack, is let's take the emotion out of it. I think the opposite. And what is annoying me, and I'm seeing it a lot online a lot, everyone's like, well, you know, it doesn't really matter these two games because as long as we have a good season, I hate to break it to you, I'm the most positive fan in the world, what are the chances of us having a good season? The definitive term of a good season for Norwich City is to be in and around the playoffs. That is a good season. Do you honestly, genuinely believe we're going to be in and around the playoffs at the end of the season? No is my answer. So therefore, beating Ipswich home and away is a massive deal. It's a massive... And I say get emotional about it. I say get emotional about it. I'm tired of this whole kind of placid, oh, it's just another game thing. It's not another game. Mm. I've messaged... I've just... I don't, I don't care. I'll call him out on it. I've just messaged Marcus Steepen on Instagram saying, you, I, I said, I hope the players know the importance of this game. And he has responded saying, yes, they do. And I, and I, and I just hope that they do. I, I think we need to be more emotional. I really do. We need to beat them. We need to beat them. Mm, I think the pressure is growing. I think a defeat to Ipswich and the pressure grows again. Uh, I think there's an acceptance that Norwich City did lose some key players over the summer. Right. And I know that annoys you. But... No, it doesn't. No, 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 no. But I mean, like, the, the fact that excuses the are being made. Yes. Yeah. I think the problem is that this is... And now, right, let's just go roll the clock back a bit. If Alex Neal doesn't get Norwich promoted in his first season, right, he gets them up in the second season, mm-hmm. and I think they stay in the Premier League because they're more equipped for mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. right? They might have Nelson Oliveira by that time, who's a better Premier League striker than a Championship striker, and you're not just hoisting balls into Juma C and Bacani, right? <laughs> oh, what a player! He was. Great player, by the way. Oh, I loved him. I used to commentate in these games in Belgium. Yeah. Absolute oh, really? legend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. man. <laughs> I used to score bags of goals. For Scared the hell out of me, but there you go. Um, yeah, big beery guy. Yeah. But I think sometimes the best thing can be, and it's hard, like Celtic, an example would be, Celtic got beat by Rangers under Mark Warburton when Ronnie Dyla was in charge, and the Celtic board scratched their heads and went, oh my goodness, we better do something about this. Bring in Brendan Rodgers, unbeaten season, two consecutive trebles. There you go. Sometimes the best thing that can happen to a football club are bad things. Yeah. Yeah, you, well, you know what I mean. With the origin yeah. recent history, yeah. that seven-one defeat to Colchester. Exactly, that's a brilliant example. So sometimes you need those moments where it's wake up and smell the coffee. Now, whether that happens this season or next season or whatever, Norwich City, I think the worst thing that could happen is that we rise like a phoenix and end up going up because we're not ready. Mm. I think we need to try and. I know it's hard. Another season of building, and then next season. Next season, to be honest. We need, I mean, regardless of whether it's Farka, anybody else, whatever, for Norwich City, as as this project that we're talking about, mm. since we brought in the sporting director, went with a different model, for the project to work next season, we need to be contending for the playoffs. We need to be. But Stuart, next and I, and I completely agree, and I, I love that mindset, and that's the mindset I'm so desperately trying to hang on to, but mm-hmm. are we building? Slowly. You think we are? I, but despite saying you well, haven't the, seen progression. There's other, yeah, on the field, I don't, think there's okay, been so enough of a progression but I'm thinking of the, the okay. thing as yeah, a whole yeah. I, I was fortunate enough to, to get some of Stuart Webber's time this week and he took me around to Colney and the work that's going on there is mm. amazing Yeah, like the culture of the football club is changing Yes, that is happening and it's happening, Norwich City everyone always does this sort of Norfolk stuck in the dark ages like chat which we know is lies but when it comes to it, the club is actually sort of waking up and moving really into yeah. the 21st century now. Mm. The problem is, on the field, the results aren't what mm. they, they really should be. I don't think our squad, as it's currently comprised, is a playoff squad, not with how strong the divisions become. But I don't think we should be bottom half. I think we should definitely be I in agree. the sort of lower regions of the top half. And then next season... We've got to build, but part of that process, and pointing back to the O'Neill Hernandez thing, is getting players in early, early enough that they can adapt yeah. so that next season yeah. we're ready to really go. We talked about hitting the ground running this season. In a way, I'm just sort of, again, kind of devil's advocate, could have been the worst thing that happened because we're not ready yet. Yeah. 
if mm. we wait next season we're going to have a few more of the big contracts off the books yeah. so that's maybe going to free up a bit more cash to go and have a bit of a splash yeah. whether I mean and Stuart Webber won't be rushed that's the thing about him he's not going to just go oh yeah mm. I fancy him let's mm. take a gamble mm. he's going to make investments in players that he believes in he but, described Kenny McLean to me as a really good free a really good free transfer mm, and that's yeah. what he's doing he's looking for value but do you think Stuart and I'm going to play devil's advocate on you now mm -hmm. do you think the reason why you have this mindset of let's have another transitional season do you think you have that because you don't watch Norwich week in week out at Carrow? I think it helps because I'll tell you what when I was walking, I out, so. when I was walking out the stadium yesterday I was feeling pain yeah, I felt yeah, you pain. said so. Yeah, yeah, uh, it wasn't nice, and that's the problem. Like, I mean, because I mean, when you're covering a club as a journalist, you've got to take the step back, and it's quite easy to do that. Because even if you, I mean, even if you're commentating for the club, it's like you're passionate, but you're still doing a job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're writing about the club, I've actually been doing a few chats with Michael Bailey, Paddy Davitt, and Dave Freezer about this this week. Um, it's different because you're yeah. doing a job and you've got to have that independent yes. sort of element but when you're just there in the stands like any other fan which I will always do when I get the chance to mm. it's hard yeah. and that mm. was that was really sore yesterday really raw if we'd done this yesterday I'd probably be a lot less measured and a lot less professional in what I'm saying mm. um, which so, I don't know use my like better and, and I guess the difference <laughs> here is, 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 is you know this is your job you're, you're getting paid essentially to do this Ted from Deerham, you know, season ticket holders. He's paying 90, to go and watch. He's paying to go and watch. Yeah. And realistically, does he care that we've got new changing rooms at Colney? Does he care that the culture off the pitch is changed? He doesn't care. He is seeing what he wants to see is an exciting performance on a yeah, Saturday. Yeah, I totally understand. And I, and I and I and I and I do love the project. I honestly do. But I'm trying to sympathise with other fans who who maybe no, just rock up at Carrow. Mm. they're not seeing improvement yes yeah. things might be going on oh, scenes. they yeah. don't see that they're not paying their money to see better yeah. facilities at Colney mm -hmm. or whatever I, I get what Stuart's saying off the pitch now it's proactive management but still yet we see week in week out on the pitch it's reactive management from Daniel Farker reactive he waits until we get whipped before we make a tactical change, before we bring the game to opposition. We've seen it week in, week out at the start of the see, season. See the Shield Webber's doing all the right stuff. Mm -hmm. Steve Stone's doing all the right stuff. Culturally, we're now making a change that we should have done under Dave McNally, but he was too blind to see it. Excellent. But for me, on the pitch still, we just look so There was more money still. to do it then. There was more money to do it hey, then exactly. under McNally. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, that's obviously a factor that could you could call into question about the way he was running things. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right, by the way. Uh, and I, I've got to say that I totally empathise with fans. Yeah. I understand why yeah, they're getting gonna say so, yeah. impatient. And I can understand the frustration that's there because I felt a lot of it myself yesterday. Mm. Um, good I'm pleased you did yeah no because that's that's part of being a yeah. football fan don't get me wrong it was easier when I didn't care about the Canaries like I mean my life was easier yeah. I mean I'm a Scottish guy <laughs> like I mean I've got enough pain watching international football <laughs> without this we pulled you in play. for a life of disappointment ah exactly um, that's it uh, we could genuinely sit here for hours and I think this is going to be one of the, the better podcasts. We, we need to get onto the Twitter questions because Stuart's got business to do after this and got a taxi. Can to I just make one last point yeah. on the reactive thing? 2-0 um, down yesterday, you expect a response after half time. The clock ticks on to 60 minutes and you're thinking, right, surely, surely there's going to be a stop before the, the, the third yeah. goal goes in. Because um, it was going that way. You could see yeah. that the third goal was more likely than us getting a goal to get back into it. And 2-1, totally different game. Game completely changes. Leeds go, oh my goodness, what's happening here? Maybe mm. we're going to pull back a bit. You know, that sort of thing. Didn't happen. Yeah. See as a parallel, Marcelo Bielsa against uh, Swansea in midweek yes. made two changes yes. by the time the second half kicked off. Also worth noting, uh, Leeds in the week against Swansea had two right backs playing at centre back, still managed to get through the game despite not being the best side. Exactly. Uh, anyway, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> Matt Gregory, now this is a really interesting one. I'm not sure if you boys have heard about this. Um, he says, Hi guys, um, how long, first of all, do you think Farker has to prove himself? We've kind of touched on that. Now, this is the bit now I want to get down. I was on Twitter and all of the Forbes last night, never a nice place to be after a defeat, but I did see this name keep cropping up. Heard rumours Craig Bellamy is the next upcoming coach Norwich would replace Farker with, and Weber knows about him from his Liverpool days. Hmm. Uh, that, that, Craig Bellamy? It's, it's, <laughs> if you're asking, do I think it would be a good appointment? I think no. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think he's got enough discernible experience there for, for, for that to happen. 
Um, also, I, I don't think there's a great deal in those rumours. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Um, Katie Lee, with Fark having a worse ratio than Peter Grant, do you think that it's time for the board to step in and get rid? It's worth Weber saying that um, Farker is replaceable, and he's put that on record many a time. Yeah, he has, yeah. Stuart? Uh, oh. yeah. I'll let you go first. Uh, We've already spoken about it, haven't we? Really, I, I just, I, I, I think me and you, have, I think we kind of want to be quite hardcore about it and say if we lose against Ipswich, then we should change things. I think me and you both kind of want that, but we're also we totally get the fact that in Stuart Webber's shoes, you ain't going to change it until Christmas, which which I know will annoy a lot of people, and believe me, it annoys me too, because if we keep losing games of football and if we lose against our local rivals. But take away the local rivals, they're bottom of the league. If we lose against someone that's bottom of the league... History warns against that. Norwich City get relegated because they waited too long to replace Chris Hume. Mm. Yeah, yeah, there you have it. Definitely. Although I did see a stat that I think said both of the last times Norwich City have lost at home in the Championship by a three-goal margin, the ma- manager's never made the next time at Carrow Road. Yeah. Just throw that out there. Yeah, CFC well. numbers. Yes, uh, who you chatted out and I followed. Didn't you? It's uh, yeah. Are you running it? Uh, no, no, oh, no, right. no, no, no. Um, actually, the guy I'm living with. Oh, really? Uh, when I'm here. He okay, interesting. It. I get him on, by the way. It's really good. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that after. Um, Ollie Bensley simply said, Delia out. Now, I will expand this slightly. Is this the squad's fault? Is this the manager's fault? We've been banging on about this. this is not... Will Norris City progress with, not, uh, with, with a lack of investment? That's what I'm going to say. Um, oh, I've opened up that, this can of worms again. Yeah, I wish I it's, too it's a debate that's been done to death. Yeah. I mean, I think what will happen with Norwich City, I've said this a few times now, because the Premier League, the money's just gone absolutely mental. Mm-hmm. Um, I think as soon as Norwich City go up, they'll get bought. That's the way that I think that it's going. So I mean, got to go up first. I think, I think an offer will come in, which yeah. Norwich City will find. We'll have to accept. Or will be unable to turn down. Yeah. Because the money's that mental, and it's such a cash cow, the Premier League mm. now, that I think... Um, that will be the the sort of the catalyst for, mm. for that time. So we just got to go up first. That's what I hope. <laughs> yeah. I I don't think it's Delia's fault. No, that no, we're no, not no. making substitutes on sixty minutes. I don't think it's Delia's fault that Tim Krull is letting in goals at his near post. I don't think it's Delia's fault that the atmosphere at Carrow Road is diabolical. Well, it may be. You should, should get back on and on the make. Yeah. yeah, great point. And so we need to bring him back. Fifth, or we need to introduce Delia's 15 minute half time meals instead of that Tim Pot Tampa Bay <laughs> half time game it needs to happen there's that sponsorship opportunity out the window <laughs> right Chris Cassidy um, judging by match day experience the Chris. best part of Jack's match day is indeed the sausage rolls which are very good at Carrow at the moment so what is both of yours favourite part of the match day mm, nice Ooh. so when I'm there as a fan not but let's do a... both okay working and fan uh, so working I mean it's quite a glib thing to say but it's just like it's an honour covering football like mm. I really enjoy it my favourite personally is um, I mean I enjoy all the post-match stuff and getting to ask managers questions and stuff like that that's really cool but my favourite thing is commentating games for the gantry mm. that's brilliant mm. and I miss it like I still commentate games but a lot of it's done off tube what yeah. we, we call it um, which means you're watching a game and just commentating it from TV images mm. which you don't convey the same passion and stuff. Mm. Um, and, and you had a good season to commentate on, or good like loads of goals. Amazing. Yeah, loads amazing. of goals. Amazing, amazing, loads of goals. Chris, um, my favourite thing is when my ultimate favourite thing. I love going one nil down, and I love it when the away fans give it large, and mm-hmm. they give you the finger, they give you this, they give you that, they get their beer bellies out, they cool you four eyes. And then we hit them. We hit them one-one. That's nice. That's great. Feeling good. And then I love it when you score a late winner. Mm. And the first thing I do, and I and I don't care admitting it, mm-hmm. I take my glasses off. I put them upside down. I stand on my seat <laughs> with my arms out, and I just give it to them. And I'm, and that is beautiful. <laughs> I love the feeling of sweet revenge in football. I think it's priceless. Mm. And I really enjoy that. I like um, when I'm not working a game. It's good to just sit with a fan, and normally, like to be honest, I can't be bothered sitting with someone that doesn't know the game. Like mm. it would be good to sit with you two lads. And by the we way, we don't know the game. I, I, no, 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 <laughs> we no, don't, no. We don't have a clue. No, I used to. Do you know what? Let's do that at some point when I'm down here. Yeah. If yeah. you can get me a ticket in the Barclay with yeah, you no guys, problem. that'd be. That'd be but cool. the condition is you have to sing because at the only mi- at the minute I'm the only Obviously person I'm singing sing. in the E block of the Barclay. So right, that's fine. Okay, good stuff. Take and then when I make a, a rash comment. 
that's completely wrong tactically, you've got to go, Jack, what are you talking about? Uh, no, 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 don't worry, I'll call you out on that. But yeah, my favourite thing as a yeah. fan is to sit with like another fan who kind of knows the game a wee bit and just actually be able to talk about the game. Yeah, mm, yeah sometimes argue. Um, right, there's, there's so many questions here. Most of them are basically Farker and Farker out. I'm trying to find <laughs> keep, keep some of them positive, come on. Um, you put your left leg in, your left leg out, and out, and out, shake it all about. Okay, well, Charlie Sop, who's a, who's a Leeds fan. Um, Ooh. Time to really see what's happening. I saw you getting excited about Timmy Pukey on here two days ago. He's a mid-table player at best, as is 90% of Norwich City's team. That's harsh. In team. terms of games this season... That's the most comfortable we've ever had an away game. You didn't even try and change it. I know, and that is that last bit. I saw that tweet earlier, and I just thought, you know what? I kind of agree. We didn't try and change the balance or the mm. impetus of the game, and that's frustrating. And if you've got teams coming and saying, Do you know what, you're easy to play against. Yeah, that's that's an indictment. It's worrying. And you know, it was interesting. Connor Southall raised the exact same point on the fan cam. I was listening to a Canary call. He said he was with a lead supporting mate in the snake pit yesterday, and he said that it's the easiest ever away game they've, they've had in, in terms of Bielsa's reign. And and I was kind of I, I was pr- I've got to this point with with Norris City at the moment, and it's worrying because I've had it before. I've had it under Alex Neil. I've had it under Hughes. And I don't I don't care that we lost yesterday. Like, I was expecting it. Mm. it. I'm not angry mm. about it. Because if I'm at, I'm just banging on the same drum every single week, and it gets mm. tiring. And I was okay going two 0 down at Leeds in the first half yesterday. I thought we were really good in the first twenty minutes. We took it to them, but at the same time, the Leeds keeper did actually make a save in the first half, mm. which shows kind of wasted energy. Second half, I was angry about. It. We didn't do anything. We were passengers. We were, we were chasing the ball. That was my worry, and, and I think yeah, we didn't try and change the game. So. I think I would just say I think it's very harsh on Timmy. I think yeah. Timmy Pukki has yeah. been thus far a shining light in terms of quite a dim start to the campaign. I think that I think I'm very very optimistic. I know Jordan Rhodes didn't score his penalty. I get that, but I think that Jordan Rhodes and Timmy Pukki they work very well together. The reason why yep. they've not produced more goods is purely the midfield not delivering to them. Purely, I think those two when they get the ball between them. And, and they play off each other excellently. And actually, so far, they've only played off scraps as well. I'm so hopeful of T- Timu. He's quietly contributed. He's been consistent. Yes, he's a mid-table championship player. But how many teams in this league have mid-table championship players that are up there fighting for the league? Because Paul, they work well as a collective unit. Paul Lambert took a table of mid- oh, yeah, yeah, a team of absolutely. mid-table championship players to the mid-table in the Premier League. So a, a lot can sometimes be made of pegging where a player belongs in the in the greater sort of mm-hmm. structure of the game. But Timu Buki won. Great finish against Preston. Got to say yeah, that. Excellent. And the main thing for him is he does all the dirty work. He does mm, all the selfless yeah, stuff. He yeah, runs away. Yeah. He creates space for other players. And I, I mean, the one big positive for me uh, against Leeds was I thought the, the forward players were all right. Hernandez mm. blew hot and cold a wee bit. But I thought those two, yeah. I thought, put in a good shift. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, uh, the, the thing I was least confident about this season was that front three. I thought Rose was going to be off the pace. Puki, I didn't really know much about. Hernandez done okay last season. They've actually been exciting at times. Yeah. We'll move on and let's stick with this attack and play. Monkey Magic Twenty Two says, "What are you using? <laughs> yeah. What's the future of Dennis Trebeni? And does Nelson Oliveira deserve a second chance? He don't score that many. That, that is a fantastic. Rap, that is isn't it? brilliant. Yeah." I'll Shout out it. to Cooper Duck. Fantastic. Yes. I saw what I will say is I saw um, I was leaving Nando's after the game on Saturday, <laughs> this and I saw. Um, Mario Vrancic walking with the mis- this mysterious bloke with a with a hat with a cap on, right? And the cap says icon, okay. And it was Dennis Rabeni. Oh, was it? Anything to read into a player of Dennis Rabeni standard wearing a hat saying icon? <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. interesting thing for me with Dennis Rabeni is, I think was he at Paderborn before us, wasn't he? I think that's right. Scored huh? a ton of goals, like an in- a ridiculous scoring record. <laughs> Comes here. Looks bang average. Like I think that shows the gulf in class between the championship and the the, the leagues we're signing for. That's what I'd read into it. However, at times, Dennis rebelli has been pretty shit this season. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I've got nothing else to add. Oh dear. Yeah, um, so what was it? So remind me of the exact question. Because of Trebelli not being the, that great impact sub, does Oliveira now deserve a chance because of that, basically? Um, I think if a decision's been made due to off-field matters mm. that Oliveira's not playing, 
other sort of circumstances in there. I don't think any footballing reason mm. will override that. Okay. Yeah, that's that's um, that harshly shifted on to Dennis Rebelli when the question was more about Nelson Oliveira, really, wasn't it? Mm. I, 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 I don't, I don't personally rate. Oliveira that highly from what I saw last season I think it's very grievous I just don't I I honestly haven't got Um, the time or mental capacity to even talk about Nelson Oliveira right now because we've just got too many other problems (laughs) (laughs) is that is that what it's come to yes we're not discussing some problems because we've got so many other problems so that laugh there that was really just like the kind of manic laughter of a (laughs) madman like on the the fringes of insanity I I tell you why I was laughing because Jack and when we signed Dennis Rabeni he had a massive Dennis Rabeni flag, um, literally. Uh, he was waving it around every game, saying, you know, Dennis Rabeni's going to bang it in. Dennis Rabeni hat-trick today, lads. Dennis Rabeni's going to score the last-minute winner. Mm-hmm. And you can see, I mean, look at his body language now. You can see a man that's been defeated. <laughs> because, you know, with every will in the world, you look at a player like Dennis Rabeni and you go, actually, let's, let's, let's take this. Let, let's not be so harsh on the guy. Let's yeah, just say what you said earlier. Trying his heart. Yeah, some yeah, of these players, will, some them. of these players will hit the yeah. ground running. Some of these players, like uh, Onel Hernandez, will take some time to settle in. And, and some of them will be absolutely crap. And, hmm. Well, like, I mean, yeah, without maybe the, the sort of flowery language, I would say Dennis Rabeni is, he'll be a hard worker. He'll be a selfless player. Um, really good assist uh, for one of the goals yes, against West Brom. Yes, yes. At uh, Birmingham. Uh, Birmingham, yeah, sorry. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think he's going to be a massive goal scorer in this division. And not exciting different players to be scoring goals, ideally. Yeah, but I do like Dennis Rabeni, and I agreed. He seems like a nice man. I'm completely fine with him wearing a hat that says yep. icon. Yeah. Uh, right, we're going to leave it there, basically, uh, mainly because we're talking so much. We've got so many problems to cover. Just basically subscribe to iTunes, the TNC podcast, and on YouTube as well. Go and follow Stuart. Links will be in the description. And also, there is going to be another podcast next week with a certain Benjamin Bloom from the Blue Monday podcast, the Ipswich fan. That is sure to be interesting. We'll be talking more about the Ipswich game on that. Stuart, thank you so much, mate. A genuine pleasure, That's as always. Good um, fun, lads. Always love it. Yeah, let us know your thoughts down on Norwich City down in the comment section below. We'll be reading them. And uh, yeah, an interesting week ahead. See you later. Bye-bye.